Good morning. I'm Ethan Zindler, head of Americas for Bloomberg NEF, and I'm glad to be with all of you today. For those of you who don't know us, Bloomberg NEF is a division of Bloomberg LP that provides primary research on the energy transition. We've been around for about 15 years and produced firsthand research on all the key technologies driving change in the energy sector worldwide, including renewables, hydrogen, nuclear, CCS, etc. I'm really pleased today to be joined by three leading players driving change in the energy space, each really from very different angles. Uh, we have the worlds of technology, finance, and academia and policy all very well represented today in the form of Danielle, Scott, uh, and Melissa. I will not um, read long bios. I know that you guys all have access to those uh, online. Um, we've only got about 30 minutes here, and there's really so much interesting stuff to discuss, especially in the wake of what I thought was a legitimately interesting and potentially momentous week last week uh, in terms of policy developments around climate. And I think those have probably been discussed a bit already this morning. But I'd like us to drill down and focus on the, the, the topic at hand here just a little bit, which is building a resilient green energy mix. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to figure out exactly how to do that today, um, but I would like us to um, at least surface a few good ideas, and I know that our panelists have plenty uh, to say about all of that. Um, the recent uh, major outages that we saw in Texas, I think, highlighted the challenges that are posed to the grid by increasingly turbulent weather as a result of climate change. And while this latest event really was particularly damaging and harmful and obviously high profile, there have been a lot of other prior events in California, Australia, and elsewhere, and hurricanes on the East Coast as well, that really highlight the fact that as climate changes, it puts real strain on our entire energy system overall. So I'd like to start our conversation out with Melissa just for a moment. First to talk maybe just for a moment about Texas, especially since you're down in Austin, um, and, uh, and what that then more broadly means for what we're seeing around the energy system um, today. So Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, so just to baseline us all, I think we're all familiar with what happened in Texas. Extreme cold front came through and put a lot of stress and strain on our systems. And as you said, Ethan, I'm down here in Austin and lived through, you know, the four days without power and the four days without water as well. And there's a few points here that we can take away from it. I mean, when we knew the cold front was coming in, we saw it coming. We had some warning and we were told that we could broadly expect to see 40 minutes of rolling blackout. That's a very different reality than four days without power. Um, and so the idea of resiliency was extremely highlighted in this. So it's not just about reliability, keeping the lights on, but making sure that when the system does fall down, that it can get back up as quickly as possible to protect our health um, and keep us safe in our homes and our businesses. So if we go through a couple of different points, I'll just say three quick things to kick us off. When we look at Texas and events like Texas, they highlight a couple of things to me. First, the integrated nature of our infrastructure. So when you look at what actually caused the failures in the system, this wasn't just about our plants. This was about the things that delivered fuels to those power plants. It was about different parts of the power plants failing in different ways. And it was also about the integrated system and the fact that we weren't regulating it in a way that they could all stand up and support each other. Second, the event highlighted that every single type of technology in the system has a risk. So when we start designing a future system that we want to be reliable and resilient, we need to think about all of those risks. Nothing is perfect. They will go down at different times. So how do we make sure that things don't go down altogether? So fossil fuel plants froze, including a number of natural gas plants. Other natural gas plants couldn't work because they didn't have fuel. Wind turbines iced over. Even our nuclear plants tripped offline. One of the reactors went down for a period of time. So moving forward, there's a strong argument to reevaluate those potential future risks in the face of a changing climate, um, and also potential future risks in the, in the form of a changing electricity mix. Third, this event highlighted the need to really think about, as we go to a transition to zero carbon fuels, what array of technologies we really need to include in that mix. And the research is really strong on this point. It's when we look at how we can affordably and effectively move to a reliable electricity system in the future, we need three buckets of technologies. We want those renewables they're really cheap when they're around. They're really great for us. But we need to complement them with storage, not just batteries for a few hours, but also long-term seasonal storage and then firm dispatchable power. Because there are periods of time in the data where the wind isn't blowing really well and the sun isn't shining really well. And we still are demanding a good amount of electricity, a lot of electricity. So we need to be able to fill that. And again, I'll say that each of these technologies comes with risks and trade-offs, but we can assess those risks in order to minimize their impacts. So those are the three things that I took away from the events in Texas. Uh, thanks. And so if I've heard you right, uh, market problems, 
potentially policy problems and technology problems. <laughs> so almost nothing yeah. went right, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, done that. We have a lot to learn from what happened. We can learn a lot from it. There's a lot of stuff went uh, wrong all at the same time. I, I like the, the positive view on that. Um, I'll bring Danielle into this, maybe just to talk about the technology part, because obviously with GE and your role there, um, I think um, Melissa hi highlighted a bunch, obviously renewables, but then also this concept of um, you know power that is sort of more on demand, but also zero carbon. Maybe tell us a little bit about you know some of the solutions and things that you're thinking about at GE as you think about these larger technology challenges. Yeah, so we had a, a really good um, first row, front row seat to what was going on in Texas because not only were our renewables team kind of um, front front and center trying to be there for our customers, we have you know our whole gas power business and our services team was also you know in the field trying to help get everything back online. So putting that all together and looking at the big picture, um, it was clear there's. Um, there's a lot to learn. And, you know, with respect to your question, Ethan, I think some of those longer term uh, storage solutions, for example, um, it, it highlighted the need to bring more of that online. But I would say the number one learning for all of us, and, you know, I think Melissa mentioned it just now, is the diversity of resources are key. And having, um, having them in a way that they don't sort of have a cascading effect. When one goes down, they don't take others down. That's going to be the systems thinking approach, the systems view of the ecosystem of our energy networks. So bringing in more energy storage that's based on batteries is great. Um, I, I don't know about whether the Texas system um, would really uh, benefit too much, but longer term storage like hydropower, we have them, but they're really not incentivized to make money when they can store. They don't get value for the capacity or the flexibility that they bring. So back to the points Melissa made about market policy, it's more than just technology. But from a technology perspective, there's there's a tremendous amount of upside in terms of new capabilities we can bring online, new connectivity between regions, and even new controls for how those renewables can interface with the grid to enhance it rather than create any tension or risk. And as, as you think about the technologies that you're developing, and by the way, first of all, I think that's a very good point, which we think of this as having been an electricity problem, but ultimately was a full energy system problem, right? In terms of the fact that mm -hmm. nat gas plants didn't produce when they needed to, and that there were issues with delivery and other things like that. Um, but as you think about those technologies, I mean, in terms of what GE is working on to try to um, provide the, the dispatchable power, are there anything, is batteries the main thing, or are there other technologies as well that we should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, well, so I would say hydro pumped storage is probably our oldest, longest term technology that, you know, the world knows a lot about, but isn't, there's still new, new opportunities to grow there, but hybridizing plants with energy storage, batteries mostly, is, is the growth space. That's where you can, can really get not only load shifting, but you can really start to think about supporting the grid in new ways. Can, can you do, do us a favor and tell us what, what, uh, pump, what pump storage means? Yeah, so um, when we think of hydropower, most people just think of using um, hydro, um, you know, the water resources to create, to generate electricity, similar to how any turbine works. Um, you're using the water to power the turbine and it creates energy. Hydro pump storage is where you can have essentially a closed loop and you'll pump water to an upper reservoir, for example, when you have excess power. And then you would use that and pump the water through the turbine to a lower reservoir when you need power. So it's very long-term, potentially very large number of days or even weeks of energy storage, depending on the size of your reservoir. It's complementary to what we see in terms of energy storage from batteries. And it's been around for a while. So new abilities, new turbine technology that allows more flexibility in how fast you can pump, how well it supports the grid. Those are all things that can come to market now. Uh, Scott, I want to bring you into the conversation and get your perspective on the financing angle of things here. Um, obviously, wind and solar are not new technologies at this point. In fact, increasingly, they're 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 large. They're uh, they're produced by by companies we all know, like GE or Siemens and others. And it seems like money is willing to support the development of those projects if they're really pretty kind of bog standard. But some of the problems that I think that that uh, Texas and other you know situations we've seen that get at this this need for other types of technologies, and I'm curious to get your thoughts around: Is there money out there for storage? Is there money out there for other types of solutions that help us address this issue of you know needing zero carbon energy that is dispatchable? Yeah, as we all know, money tends to follow money, 
And money has been made in clean energy for the last many years, even if it wasn't noticed by the general population. And what we've seen is proof point after proof point of how the more distributed, more decarbonized grid or power sources can deliver more value to customers at the end of the day. And money starts with the customer paying something for something that solves a problem for them. And I think what we often forget is that our entire energy system hasn't been set up to serve individual customers. It's been set up to serve wide swaths of customers because that's how we managed to socialize the costs to build large scale central station generation power plants and the infrastructure needed to transmit that power from its source to its use. What's changed in the last 50 years is all of these different technologies making it much more compelling for the customer because the customer can get a more resilient, more affordable, more sustainable energy grid if the customer so chooses. And that is what's different today. And the money is flowing to support that, whether it's microgrids in Texas like we've built that have kept the lights on and the water flowing even during that crazy catastrophic event that we saw a few weeks ago, whether it's solar plus storage microgrids that we've built and now own and operate in California when wildfire season came around last year, whether it's electric vehicles and the and the transition from a liquid fuel to a, an electric powered transportation fleet, we're seeing the money flow. And the money again is flowing because the money is being made by serving customers better than our old fossil fuel infrastructure that we have has served those customers. So I think what's interesting about those examples, Scott, is you know we mentioned a couple of things that are truly distributed types of energy systems, systems that are closer to the ground, and that that's that seems like a potential sol solution. Does it pose a problem though in terms of cap capital at scale in the in the sense that you know some of the biggest banks wanted to they do want to do deals in the you know hundreds of millions, not in the fives to ten million when you. Is the is the the next phase of all this going to be a massive build out that's much closer to the the ground level and presents a lot more opportunities for smaller financiers and maybe not as many for big banks or is it more that banks have to just change their perspective and look at smaller projects? Well, I think it's both. Again, the money follows the money, and there's money to be made in a more decentralized, more decarbonized set of power sources. And so you're seeing banks adjust their behavior to be able to support these these smaller scale projects usually in a portfolio approach where they can actually, you know, write a very large check, which justifies, you know, their attention and gets them the fees that they need in order to pay attention. Um, but also you're seeing, you know, large scale infrastructure companies and infrastructure funders like pension funds moving into this market because they know there are customers who are demanding this more decentralized grid infrastructure, and because, frankly, it makes a better risk-adjusted return for their capital than the traditional infrastructure that they've funded historically does. And, and Melissa, is this, that- just sort of on this point, yeah, this is a great point to carry on from, Ethan, because it talks about, so we have gotten good at putting our money behind certain types of projects. The question is, how do we get money behind holistic systems view solution so to a fully decarbonized grid and this is a policy question this is a markets question because you know it's great and we need money behind wind and solar projects absolutely that's bucket number one we need money behind batteries and pump storage so these water batteries effectively number two but we also need longer term seasonal storage we need to figure out how we can make hydrogen or other zero carbon gaseous fuels that can be stored for long periods of time how do we make them work and in the firm dispatchable power what do we do with nuclear? How do we get funding behind it if that's going to be part of the solution in, in large parts of the country that don't have other good renewable resources? How do we get money behind, maybe it's fossil fuels to CCUS? I mean, these solutions, how do we get the funding behind the whole solution and not just one of the three buckets? That's a question I have. And really, it comes down to policy and market decisions. Uh, yeah, I, I think, think market design will, sorry, just to add, I think market design will be a big topic um, throughout the next year, where Absolutely. a lot of the system operators are going to be experimenting with different ways to value capacity and flexibility in addition to pure energy. Yeah, we talk a lot about the aging infrastructure that we are employing here in the U.S. 
What may be more outdated than the infrastructure itself is the policy regime that governs it. And it's pretty interesting to think about how much system design needs to take place in order to completely overhaul an infrastructure fleet, a, a, you know, a, 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 an amount of steel in the ground on which we rely every day and which we cannot push pause to reboot, right? And that is a challenge. And, and we haven't seen the United States take it on as a system. We've seen it taken on at a much more local level. And that's where energy regulation tends to be, at a much more local level, which again undermines this question of, can we create a system-wide approach to address the problems like climate change, but also like reliability? No, I think those are all great points. And, and to be clear, you know, it's pretty easy to start to get real wonky in talking about you know, power market reforms and everything like that. But at the end of the day, what you're really talking about is just creating a system where everyone can actually get paid and make money to provide power into the system yep. in harmony in some way that works for everybody. And I think sometimes that can get a little lost. Uh, I'm going to shift gears because we, we are, believe it or not, already sort of halfway, more than halfway through. But I wanted to talk a little bit about last week because it really was such an interesting week. And maybe I'll start with you, Daniel because among the four of us, you were the one who was actually participating in the, in the White House um, climate conference. And so wanted to get your, your take. But, I, but my overall question for all of you is, um, in addition to telling us what it was like to be there, Danielle, is uh, it, were, did any of the commitments you heard last week, are, they, are any of them going to change your lives in terms of what you do day to day? Um, but Danielle, first, go ahead. Yeah. Um Thanks, Ethan. I think the biggest takeaway for me was that although it was forecast ahead of time, it was great to hear the commitments come in as aggressively as they were postured. I mean, the U.S. Um, having a 50 percent reduction by 2030 is a big deal. That's that's more aggressive than the Paris Agreement. So this is, um, I think, a big step forward for the U.S. in terms of our climate ambitions. And ultimately, I think that gives us in the technology community, especially as we're thinking of new innovation to help us get there, uh, I, you know, much of a tailwind, and it gives us a lot more opportunity to bring things to market that, you know, with more confidence that there will be a, a demand for it. Um, other than that, I would say the other takeaways were the, the broad multilateral kind of cooperation that came forward with all, so many government leaders, so many heads of state, all sort of showcasing what they can do within their own realms, and then having companies speak up about their own commitments. Um, it, it really did highlight the fact that people are seeing this as an opportunity more so than um, positioning ourselves to, to fight against some threat, which obviously it's both, but to, to view it as an opportunity, as a way to develop capability and create jobs, I mean, it's just gonna have that much more momentum. And there were things earlier in the week, um, I'd say one of the most exciting ones I heard was the, the launch of the GPST, the Global Power Systems Transformation Consortia, you know, utility and grid operators around the world collaborating to develop a new blueprint together, effectively saying, we can learn better and position the world better together. That's the kind of that's the kind of cooperation that we need to do this. So it was really appealing to see all that in one place. Uh, Scott, uh, we started the, the week last week with the U.S. committed to cutting its CO2 emissions 26 to 28 percent by 2025. We ended the week with the U.S. committed to covering the, cutting them 50, 50 to 52 percent um, by 2030. Um, when you woke up this morning on Monday, uh, and, and I know you're just getting started out there on the West Coast, but has your life changed in terms of doing your day-to-day -day job based on that? Not really. And, you know, as we all sometimes forget, the best four years of renewable energy in history were Trump's. And so as much as the federal policy that we see today is encouraging for those of us who care about some of these problems like energy poverty, water scarcity, food insecurity issues and obviously climate change, you know, the federal policy needs to translate into local action in order for it to matter. And so it's great to hear these platitudes and commitments from world leaders. And it is really encouraging for the conversation to pivot to the opportunity side because it is an economically driven proposition, first and foremost, where people can make more money, have more prosperity, have more safety, more security with these clean energy transitions underway that we're talking about. It has not changed our life at Generate. The momentum was clear because again, the customers have been demanding that we make this transition 
for them to be better supported, for them to make more money, for them to be more reliable, and for them to be more sustainable and, and address their own stakeholders with the level of respect that they want to have. Uh, well, with that, let me put Melissa really on the spot then, which is, okay, so uh, how on earth are we going to cut our emissions 50% by 2030? I mean, I realize it was versus a 2005 baseline, but it's a very, it's actually a very, very ambitious target. What, what's, the, what's the path look like to actually doing that? Yeah, so this is a question because we've been in academia and analysis groups, we've been looking at pathways forward to different targets. And you know, there's a, ver a variety of them. You can say, okay, net zero by mid-century or the power sector being zero by 2035. I mean, there's lots of different analyses. This set of announcements last week, this is a new target to say, okay, that's great. We have a goal. It's not law yet. Maybe it will be, but it is a goal. What will it actually take to get there? And what will it take, not just across technology, but also all the things we've been talking about, markets, regulations, policy, to set up an ecosystem in which we can have a paved path forward versus a really bumpy road? Um, so in terms of the work that we're doing, it, it really is just tightening the importance of what we'd already started doing, which was saying, okay, if that is the goal, if it was 2035 yesterday, 2030 today, what will it practically take to get us there, to get funding in place, to get the you know infrastructure actually built, to get the steel on the ground? So at the center, we put together a number of reports outlying transition pathways and what needs to be done to get us there. So how do we build up the grid to make sure it's reliable? How do we make sure that we're investing in innovation? Because when you look at the numbers and when you look at the technology on the table today, it's not a 100% solution yet. It's far from it. So we need to invest on that. We need to what is it, walk and chew gum at the same time, build a lot of stuff, <laughs> bring down the emissions while investing in innovation to make sure that the technologies we need to get to zero are there. So that's what things like last week signaled to me. It's increased ambition. Okay, we've got to look at the numbers and think practically, how do you get it done? How do you create that system? In, in terms, maybe for all of you, anyone want to jump in on this, though, in terms of follow through on that, what what's kind of the most important domestic policies that now have to happen in order for the this country to actually achieve that very ambitious goal. I think it will be I mean, very I don't hard point to one. To address. Go ahead. <laughs> Why don't we start with you, Danielle? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, I think anything that gives us a sense of um, continuity and that we can forecast what to expect is going to help in this space, whether it's developing a supply chain, uh, developing financing pathways for people in the community to understand the consistency of the, of the path will help. Yeah, building on that point, I would say we always ask policymakers for TLC, transparent, long-term, certain policy. Those have not been present in the energy debate and the climate policy debate uh, in the United States, unless you go to a more local level. And without TLC in the policy arena, the private sector is going to move in fits and starts. And that's exactly what we can't afford when you start looking at the science of the problem. We need the private sector mobilized, all moving in the same direction. And the way you get there is with transparent, long-term and certain policy. And frankly, I don't know that we can get there without putting a price on carbon itself. Uh, and we'll see if that's something that's gonna come out of Congress, but I'm not holding my breath. Melissa, I mean, I mean, specifics on U.S. stuff. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of policies now under consideration through this, you know, the, the White House stimulus plan. Um, and then there's a lot of regulations um, that we're expecting out of the administration this year, potentially on transportation uh, and even on the power, power plants as well. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the science and we look at where technologies are available today, but for a variety of reasons, they're not actually deploying as quickly as we need them to. I, I'm going to steal your TLC, Scott, because it's about having long-term policy. The most efficient way, according to the analysis, is to have a holistic policy that says, what is the goal? The goal is zero carbon. How do you get there? You create a structure that allows every technology that can support getting you to that goal to play and to get paid to play. And you set that in long term so that you can get there. That's the smoothest pass. Now, reality check. We can't get that. What's the next best thing? What's the next best thing? What's the next best thing? We know that the power sector is the leader of this transition. It's got the most technologies that are ready to go today. It's also the backbone of decarbonizing all the different parts of the economy. So, okay, what can we do as a short-term win in that to actually move that system faster? 
Same questions for transportation. What can we do with light duty vehicles while we figure out the rest of the system? And then across industry, what are the efficiency things that we can be doing? And um, there's a great piece actually by University of Maryland that gives us a start on this. It outlines what are real policies with existing authorities, but also with things that aren't as far reach as maybe that can get us on the path. But I completely agree. If we don't have a pathway forward to the ultimate target of net zero, we're going to have fits and starts. We're not going to have as smooth of a pathway as we want. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take the starts and take those emissions reductions. We absolutely should. But it will be a less efficient transition, for sure. I think that's a great point. I mean, I think one of the, as you, as you do note, you know, it, it's been the power sector that has been rapidly decarbonizing in the U.S., the other sectors haven't really, frankly. Um, but if you electrify the fleet pretty quickly, if you have a decarbonized power sector, then you can enjoy more of the benefits um, there overall. But um, there are obviously a lot to come and, and a lot that we're, we're looking for the administration to, to fill in the blanks on um, over the coming uh, year or so. I have a couple questions in the chat here, that, and one of which I want to mention, but um, we have a very short period of time and these are not easy questions, but I'll throw this first one out. Um, where is nuclear in the clean energy discussion? I'll add, I'll yes, just comment nuclear... from an innovation, sure. innovation perspective. Sure. Yeah. There is a lot of innovation in small modular nuclear. Um, if, a, if a country or a region is um, happy to embrace nuclear, I would say that's a real big opportunity to move forward in a more um, uh, economic and feasible way. I think it'll differ around the world, but I think it's, we should not turn away any clean energy solutions at this point. And I'll say yeah, it's already part question. of the clean energy mix today. So we have to ask ourselves questions about what we're going to do to keep power plants online that are supplying zero carbon resources. And then what do we do with these future technologies? I mean, it's both questions at once. Because in the U.S., at least, we have a large number of reactors still producing zero carbon power. Scott? Nucle well, nuclear is just the most expensive clean, clean power source to build today. So we have to remember that. It is... 10 times more expensive to build nuclear power or more than a new solar wind or even solar plus you know battery storage solution today it's an important and 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 prominent source of clean power around the world and i agree with the points made that we need to keep the uh, low carbon power sources flowing but i think if if you actually believe what i've been saying and what a lot of the panelists have been saying that it's an economically driven opportunity it's going to be hard to see where nuclear fits into the future energy mix without a dramatic reduction in the cost to build those uh, plants and the cost to operate those plants. 